it's really interesting. I think it's a human trait across all time and cultures, or nearly all, all times and cultures, is looking for answers for things, our sort of insatiable yeah. human need to try and find answers for things. And when you're confronted in the real world, in real life, in, in your lifetime, you're confronted with something that is sort of mind-bogglingly terrifying and there's no real answers for it, like a plague. So you called it the uh, yeah. the plague of Galen or sometimes it's the, the Antonine plague, which we don't think is mm -hmm. um, an actual plague. It might have been sort of smallpox or measles or something. But anyway, the point is it swept off something like 20, 25% of all people. I mean, a, t a terrifying yeah. pandemic. Horrifying. Yeah, yeah. yeah, quite literally horrifying. And in lieu of having any idea of what it is and why, or what you can do to battle against it. If any, if if you can find any kind of solace or answer anywhere, yeah. then then that's going to be appealing, isn't it? And as you say, sort of the classical right. Roman paganism, sort of you know uh, the uh, you know people that are devotees of Saturn or Jupiter or something. Um, it doesn't offer you anything, does it? It's just the gods right. are capricious yeah. and they're going to do what they're going to do, and you're at their whim, and that's yeah. it. That's the end of the story. So it does make right. sense, absolutely, yeah. doesn't it, that in the first second century. AD, the, the, type, the age of sort of Marcus Aurelius, that it would be appealing to people that don't know any better, have got nothing else to, to draw upon. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I focused on the actions, that the actions of the early Christians were more efficacious. They actually helped. Um, people started to notice that Christians survived plagues better than pagans. Right. Um, but you're bringing up something else, which totally is the other side of the coin, right? The, 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 the other thing that needs to be emphasized, which is that it, it isn't only that we want to have, um, you know, utilitarian action. I mean, that is, you know, you'd rather, you'd rather survive than not survive. You'd rather your family survive the plague than not survive. So that's pretty appealing, right? Mm -hmm. but, 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 but as you say, that's not really enough for humans simply to be utilitarian. It also has to kind of be satisfying metaphysically satisfying right and so yes they're they're metaphysically unsatisfied you might say <laughs> that's what we're seeing in the in the in the um roman empire they're unsatisfied and it's having lots of results as i emphasized in my talk they're not having children they're not reproducing they actually fall below um replacement rate pagans, under uh, pagans, Julia, under julius the pagans do yeah yep. pagans fall under um replacement rate under Julius Caesar, under Caesar, right. Right. prior to Christ. Right. And he's the one who's, he's one of the ones who's, or, or he's one of the earliest who uh, passes a law that you will get various benefits if you have three children. You know, um, that is the Roman Empire recognizes they've got a, a problem that people are not reproducing in the empire and actually tries to take action to do something about it. I'll just give it, give it, give it, give away uh, the spoiler here. It doesn't work, and the Roman Empire can continues throughout this period to have a problem with its population reproducing. Um, so, you know, to me, that is like it is these days. That is a real cry for help. You could say when a people stops reproducing itself, mm. that that tells you something, right? Mm. That's there's a lack of vita vitality going on there, right? When people are vital, you know, you, the Spinglerian, you know, the age of vitality, right? Um, when people are vital, they have children, they reproduce, they're, they're, they're hopeful about life, right? Mm -hmm. And when, when, they, when they lack that, they just stop having children, not having very many, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it speaks so of- So it's like um, they're, they're petering out, you know? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. Go yeah, ahead. no, you're absolutely right. It speaks of some sort of- um... Uh, something vapid, something terribly hollow at the heart of your yeah. cultural civilization. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it's really worrying. Yeah. It, it, very, very yeah. worrying. Um, it makes me feel sad. I'm feeling sad for, yeah. the, for the, the Romans, you know? I mean, what what did it feel like for them, you know, that they didn't even want to bother to have children? Mm. Yeah, it's well, the sad. future seems sort of profoundly hopeless, that it would be a cruel thing to have children, <laughs> to condemn them to the near that. future that's going to be horrible. Uh, you, know. you hear people say that right now. How mm. could I bring a child into this world? Have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, people say that today. Mm. I mean, what a profoundly sad thing for someone to say that. That mm. that speaks to a deep, like you're saying, a deep sort of spiritual emptiness. Mm. Mm. Right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's one parallel uh, 
with the we talk about the plague of uh, Galen or the Antonine plague, uh, parallel with perhaps I wonder what you think of this. Um, in the the Black Death of the thirteen late thirteen forties, thirteen fifty odd, where it seems because I've read lots of accounts and things from from that particular plague, which is a you know true plague, a bubonic pneumonic plague. Um, where people mm-hmm. sometimes lots of well, it affects people psychologically in all sorts of different ways, and some become a lot more pious a lot Mm -hmm. more religious and some uh, it makes them completely abandon uh religiosity on every level they they Mm -hmm. feel as though they've been abandoned by their god or gods um and so why should i bother believing in it anymore and i think it's really quite interesting the way it sort of makes extremes on both ends of the spectrum there and i wonder if you've got any insights with the, the 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 antonine plague whether it did that whether it was just simply a boon for Christians in the broadest sense, or whether there's sort of more to it than that. If there's more going well, you're on getting, psychologically. You're, you're, you're getting beyond my knowledge at this oh, point. Okay. I, I Because what, what, what we'd really want to look for there, right, is um, not only what I focused on, that is that Christianity, I'm sorry, the, the ratio of pagan to Christian shifted in favor of the Christians after that plague. Mm. And then after mm. another one in the 200s, that was also yeah, the uh, quite terrible. Plague, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, the, in, in each case, the ratio shifted in favor of the Christians. Now in this plague of Galen, it's uh, Antonine plague. It, it, it's not that dramatic in terms of absolute numbers because it's still pretty early days in terms of just the absolute numbers of Christians. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, but by the, the third century plague, it's pretty significant, the shift in, in right. um, ratio of plagues. You know, I mean, you know, it, well, it's significant in both cases, but it, it's like getting more noticeable mm-hmm. after that mm-hmm. plague in the 300s, right? Um, so, uh, I'm sorry, I've lost my train of thought. Uh, oh, yeah. So what we'd want to look for is, did we see not only a shift in favor of the Christians after the plague, uh, pagans are becoming are more likely to become Christians. More Christians just literally survive because they take care of each other better than the pagans take care of each other. But also, pagans uh, become Christians more after these plagues. Right. Um, so there's uh, uh, an increase in converts, right? Mm. But mm. one suspects because of the dynamic we're talking about, just the search for answers, the the effect of a crisis. Mm-hmm. Then, mm. if I knew more about the ancient world. Uh, I would probably find that there's some other things going on in response to the plague, right? Mm. Some people may be trying to, uh, you know, get more serious about their paganism, maybe other cults getting a foothold in the empire that had not been doing very well. Suddenly the plague comes along and people are getting the Mithraism. I don't know. That that's now you're getting beyond my knowledge. Of, <laughs> okay. You know, the enough. other things going on religiously at the time. So. But you talked about their crisis just in general. It doesn't have to be sort of a a, a, a health a crisis plague. like a plague. It could be also because yeah. anyone that knows their sort of uh, uh, late antiquity will know of the crisis of the third century. Historians love to talk about, which is a mm. multifaceted thing. There's lots lots going on there, and we can't we can't even really barely scratch the surface on it, but suffice to say that there's all sorts of things going on. And you could say that, well, you talked about the Tetrarchy right at the beginning. So the age of Diocletian, where we, mm-hmm. uh, just to briefly mention to people, there's a, the Emperor Diocletian who realises that, well, he, I don't know if he's correct in realising it, but he thinks in his mind that the empire is just too big. Um, and mm-hmm. so we'll split it up into sort of the rule of four. We'll have two Augustuses, two Augusti at the top, and two junior emperors under them, two Caesars under them. So you've got basically got sort of four emperors with two senior ones right. and, and two junior ones. Um, but then each, in, each with each with their own like territory to watch over or something. Right. right? Basically, the Roman yeah, Empire yeah. split into four bits essentially. Right. Um, mm-hmm. And but then we've got in the generation directly after that is the age of Constantine, who yeah. <laughs> spends... Reconsol- reconsolidates. Yeah. yeah, spends basically most of his career, or nearly the first half of his career or more, um, uh, uh, reconsolidating it all under just his control. Um, right. And, of course, Constantine has gone down in history as um, famously, quite rightly, I suppose, as the first Christian emperor. But mm-hmm. I don't know how much you, how much detail you know about his life and reign, but... How that worked out, because he, you know, I think it's fair to say that well, he wasn't baptized until on his deathbed. 
But he did sort mm-hmm. of he did convert though, didn't he? Before you know, before the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. So still really on in like the early, the very early three hundreds, like three oh five, three oh six, that sort of time. Um, but he was he used it in um, a different way. He wasn't like a sort of a modern patriarch or a pope or a bishop or anything like that. He was still a very sort of secular man. He's still interested in secular power in the very real sense, in winning battles and destroying his enemies and all that sort of thing. So that's quite different to sort of our modern concept of, uh, of, of Christianity, where it's, you know, very forgiving and loving and being meek and mild and turning in the other cheek and all that sort of thing. So uh, I just wonder what you think about it. You must have some thoughts all about um, uh, Constantine and uh, how, right. he's, how he's thought of in our age. Okay, well, I want to make two completely different points. Okay, First, please stay, please stay. Uh, recognize that he has got a personal influence. Remember, I said that there were Christians even in the household of the emperor. Mm. Um, that is, the uh, elites were being drawn into Christianity, into this new cult, um, which, which sociology teaches us that that's how it works. Um, Sorry, Stephen, it's too glib to say that it becomes fashionable. Is that is that too glib? Um. I, I think, you know, this is a long period, so I think we couldn't say it's fashionable for 300 years, right? Okay. <laughs> but yes, I think I think it, it, it falls in and out of being something that's fashionable. Okay. But whether it's considered fashionable at the moment, sort of in the air, in the zeitgeist, elites are quietly joining it throughout this period, right? right. Including in the House of the Emperor, in particular, as you probably know, uh, Helena, I think is the name, mm-hmm. Constantine's mother. Mm. Right. Mm. So Christianity now is not just in the household of the emperor. It's literally the emperor's mother. And I think that we can debate about how sort of strategic Christian Constantine's conversion is. I don't know his heart. Maybe it was. I don't know. But you could see it as just being a political move, a cynical political move. Right. Um, or, well, let, let me come back to that. I, I don't think that's the right way to think. That's our modern way to think. Let me fix that in a sec. Um, but I think everyone believes that Helena herself was just honestly a Christian, just sincerely a Christian. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a political calculation on her part. She was, she was just a convert, and she influenced her son. Right. Um, okay, so yeah, that, now my second point, and we'll segue in terms of how cynical is Constantine's conversion. Okay, <laughs> This is to make this division of um, thought and action that I think is not quite right, uh, is is sort of a modern thing. For Constantine, uh, if Christianity is helpful to him politically and as emperor, then that is a testimony to its truth, I think. Right? So so don't think of it as um, he has this personal religious experience, and then he starts spreading, you know, pushing Christianity as the emperor. Think of these things as a little more united. And the reason I say this is because um, that picture of Christianity is just peaceful and not having to do with battle and conquering. I think that is, again, it's a very, it's, it's kind of modern, and also it's focusing on the very, very early church. But there's another period of Christianity that we should have a better understanding of, um, which we're not going to get into this time, but maybe we could do another time. And that is the ongoing spread of Christianity throughout Europe over the next uh, over a thousand years after Constantine. Right. Because the last country to become Christian, last European country to become Christian, isn't until like 1400 or something. Right. So, you know, yes, Christianity won in, in the Roman Empire, as we've described, but then Rome fell or the Western Roman Empire fell, right? So what happened in, in Europe? Well, it's it's a complicated story. And there is a book, which I've got sitting on my shelves. I'm looking for an excuse to read it and talk about it with someone called The Barbarian Conversions. Big, thick book that goes through that thousand year history. It really starts with where we're leaving off. That is early Christianity winning in the Roman Empire. It, it starts there and takes up the story of what happens to Christianity in Europe for the next thousand years. How is it that Spain becomes Christian and the, the um, 
Scandinavian countries become Christian. Right, right, right. It's that they're not all Christian in 400 AD. That's for no, darn sure. Right, absolutely. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. So there's a very complicated story. And you'd think we would know more about it because for those of us who are European, it's our story, hmm. right? It's our story of like the last 1500 years. And we don't really know it. I don't know it. I just have a big thick book that's going to tell me about it when I get around to it. If you enjoyed that video of Radical Liberation and I chatting, um, the full video can be found at lotuseaters.com. The link is in the description.